Hey everybody, today I am going to be reviewing Saltburn. This film was directed by Emerald Fennell. This is Fennell's second feature-length film after Promising Young Woman, which came out a couple years ago, and I revisited scenes of that very recently in preparation for this film because it had been a while uh, since I had seen that one. It's a pastiche, but ultimately it proved to be reductive more than anything. I think it kind of shied away from a lot of the questions that it poses about uh, new wave feminism or the, or the questions that it's hinting at. That just cheapened the whole thing, especially the main character's motivation motivations just as an anti-hero. I think one of Fennell's strengths is, is her uh, attention to aesthetic and how she's able to kind of fill all of these worlds with all of these very interesting, very specific textures, but I don't think she always understands the point of all of those embellishments. A lot of the frothiness in her movies I think hinders uh, a lot of the truth from protruding through when it needs to. I do think that Saltburn overall as a movie is better than uh, Promising Young Woman. I think it's better constructed and it's more ambitious overall, and yet it has a lot of similar problems for me. Now going into Saltburn, I knew that it was going to be very polarizing just because the reactions to this movie have seemed to be all over the place, very colorful uh, to say the least. Even when I was giving my ticket to the ticket guy uh, when I went to go see this today, he was like, I hear this is supposed to be a wild movie. So you guys know my favorite movies to review or my favorite movies to go into are the ones that are very polarizing, the ones that, that split people. And now after having seen it, I can tell you this is not one of those movies where I thought what's the big deal? No, it, it totally makes sense why people are um, so confused by it. I will say it's, um, it's, it's an experience. Nothing at all about it feels clear to me so far as what I feel about it, whether I like it or whether I don't, because I really don't know. And honestly, even with the second viewing, I have no idea what I will think about it. I can see myself liking it a lot less the second time. I can also see myself liking it more a little bit. I, actually, I can see myself liking it a lot less and a lot more simultaneously. Yeah, at the same time, which is, is weird. Both of her films, I want them to be so much better than they actually are, and so much about them make me want to roll my eyes, they piss me off, and yet I think about them for a very long time after the fact. It's a very strange energy when you are both bored by a movie as well as riveted, you're annoyed, yet you're kind of smirking through it at the same time. The setup for Saltburn in the story is a lot more ambitious and more complicated, I would say. This is a tale of a, an anti-hero named Oliver, and that is played by Barry Keoghan, and he is an Eve Harrington of sorts. He is entering this large, wealthy estate called Saltburn, and he is on the prowl. He is conniving, and he is ready to manipulate his way to the top by finding all of the most sensitive pressure points of these wealthy people, you know, their inflated sense of selves. From a tension perspective, Oliver's motivations are withheld from the audience for a very long time, and so much of his behavior because of that is peculiar to us, I would say for the first maybe couple acts of the movie. And that allows for a lot of winding plot devices to constantly shift, and that's going to keep us on our toes as audiences. You think the film is starting to fit one genre mold and then it starts to blend into the other one, so it relies a lot on that cunning nature for the tension. This is a satire that is about the rich and the privileged, and yet ultimately the, the emotional center of the film is more about connection or lack thereof through the pursuit of that success. All the power dynamics, the masculine and the feminine, and the way they're twisting and subverting through, all, through physical arousal, this primal rage, all of these bodily fluids that are kind of leaking into this elegant cold exterior here. This film does have like an art house European type of feel to it, but it's peppered with that wry humor that feels almost like it's from a Coolidge painting, as in like, you know, the pets playing poker, um, the comedy of manners angle. Fennell using those pastiche elements to be the binding of her overall project I think can be clever at times, but more just on a superficial level. At other times it just feels a little bit trite. There's just so many references here that are just on the nose, like The Shining. I'm just really, really tired of all the, the Kubrick references that we see here. They're just so, so tired. The creepy elements that they try to use just feel laughable, and not laughable in a chilling way, like, you know, the way that we see in The Shining. You know, like right here we have a, a butler, a waiter, or whatever, and he's very like Mrs. Danvers-esque. But it's so over the top that it just doesn't work, whether as comedy or as horror. There are a lot of literary references in the movie. Everything from, like I mentioned Mrs. Danvers, from like gothic stories like, you know, Rebecca or the talented Mr. Ripley, even Midsummer Night's Dream, there's a major reference there in the third act. But one of my favorites is kind of how this movie, it's almost like a fratty drug house uh, version of Harry Potter with Barry Keoghan as like this weird, twisted doppelganger version of Harry Potter. And Saltburn, in a sense, is Hogwarts. I look at 
uh, Jacob Elordi as Phoenix here, and he's almost like Cedric Dickory. I'm really not a Harry Potter expert or fan like a lot of people of my generation, but uh, I do recall the climax in that movie, and I can't help but draw comparisons between Saltburn and, you know, Cedric's fate in The Goblet of Fire, I believe. Yeah, a twisted Harry Potter with all of this, like, violent sexual subversion to it. I just love that idea. It's so, so clever just uh, as a concept. Um, but the obviousness of a lot of these devices and the laziness of the plot construction is just really frustrating. And yet there is enough creativity in the packaging of it where I almost admired it. I almost admired how uh, forward everything is, how on the nose everything is. Just the eccentric kind of animalistic humor to it and the lack of social boundaries here. There's something about it that is, yes, awkward and peculiar and intriguing. Again, all of this manipulation and sex and everything doesn't feel rooted in anything concrete. Oliver here is very driven as a character, but it's like, why is he so driven and, and to what end? He slithers through this house and disrupts the order piece by piece and uses using the pity and the shame and the ignorance of these rich people against them. It's very clear to me that Fennell was very inspired by Kyogen's performance in Killing of a Sacred Deer, which is a performance that I bring up a lot in regards to Barry Kyogen, just because I think it's one of the great villain performances maybe of the last 10 years. It's just incredible and bone chilling. And, you know, again, I've said all of this about Kyogen in the past, but he just has such a unique face in the sense that it's like it's old and wise and, and battered, but also very youthful and, and childish at the same time. There is something creepy about him and removed, and yet there's something that you're drawn to, almost attractive about him. There's something diminutive about him, and yet also brutal and intense. It's just a great energy. His eyes, especially, you know, they're blue to where they almost look like they're made of glass. Almost alien-like, and he never appears like he's acting. It's like nothing, no decision he makes on screen ever feels forced. It's like he's never seeking the performance, he just arrives at it. And my problem is never with him, it's more in the construction of his character. It's the choices and why they are made that ultimately feels flimsy when you really start thinking about it. I don't think that Fennell is breathing enough color into these symbols for them to exist beyond just what they represent on a very basic level. They never overcome the need to make this, you know, grander point about things. And so ultimately, again, it starts to feel more hollow, ironically. And the looseness of those symbols is just really a problem. I couldn't help but constantly think about killing of, the sac killing of a sacred deer and how Kyogen's character as a function is very similar in that film, but it works in an oversimplified sense in that movie because there's way more cohesion. A lot of the deeper meaning is, is held intact with that film, whereas this feels more like you know, a skin deep kind of pastiche fun house or whatever, more like a scrapbook of sorts. I don't know if we coin the term scrapbook cinema, but that's what I'm saying for this. Sure, the fact that Oliver is always one step ahead of us and we're really never sure why he's doing what he does, it keeps the audience on their toes constantly throughout the movie. And yet it's just not saying much of anything outside of that other than just like, you know, tension building. So when things are revealed, you just feel kind of cheated. And it's like, why withhold that information from the audience? It would make more sense, I think, to build the tension more between Oliver and Phoenix or more of the tension between Oliver and the mother there. So more is revealed about him, maybe psychologically, internally, because the scenes where the characters are making each other uncomfortable, pinning each other down metaphorically or literally, all of that is really interesting because you feel kind of this squirmy, erotic, tension. But again, once you have a bigger perspective, the framing of everything just feels like Fennell is overcompensating for something. I've complained about it a lot, but there's just, there's like an academic inflated sense of delusion, I feel like, with a lot of directors these days. And I want them to balance that out with actually, you know, arriving at some truth, some honesty uh, within the, the, the writing. It's like, don't just reuse concepts and images from other greater films just because you can. It's like, really think about what makes that interesting and how can we make that refreshing and you know, how can we understand that in a new way? And then just follow that line all the way through. I don't need a lot of exposition. I don't need a lot of these metaphors to be explained for me. I'd rather just see things unfold. And there are great scenes like that in the movie where everything feels very playful and you can almost feel that honesty coming through just from the simplicity of, of the action on screen because it feels almost like it's um, improvisational. I think that's achieved very well in the final scene of the movie and I'm not gonna give it away, but you'll know what I'm talking about when you see it. Um, but yeah, there was something just really blissful and wonderful about it, but also cynical in all the right ways. And I just wanted, I guess, a lot more of that. Her instinct to be kind of wild and punk rock, whatever, you know, I think is really great. And I think she can build on it. I do think that she is getting better as a director. She's continuing to engage me, but I still think she has a long way to go. I want her to find the balance between the over analysis of themes and really applying those in an interesting way. So yes, with this movie, I am going to recommend it. But when I recommend it, it's 
just be prepared. You may hate it. You might love it. You might feel both things simultaneously. You might switch between one or the other depending on the scene, but it is definitely an experience, a polarizing experience. And that is my review. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm going to plug my website as always. It is deepfocuslens.com. I'm an artist. I do commission portraits and I sell prints of my work, that kind of thing. If that's something that you're interested in, you can always go to the website below. And if you have a question about a commission or a print, you can always email me. My email is in the description box below as well. Also, I'd like to give a shout out to my patrons who are fantastic. Guys, thank you so much for your support. Welcome to all the new members. If you are interested in supporting, the link for that is below, as well as the rest of my social media information. You can watch more videos here, and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.